Um, okay, well, thank you all for joining us. I think we've probably got people online now. Um, I'm Sarah, I'm a Global Health Journalist at The Telegraph and I'll be hosting the event this evening. We're here to discuss Claire and Mark's new book, which looks in depth at the, pub, at, well, the, the mechanism of the public health emergency of international concern and how that's declared from both a legal and a political standpoint. I think two years ago you could maybe forgive them for thinking this a niche, overly technical subject that you could largely ignore. But the pandemic has completely shone a spotlight on how the global health system works, how the World Health Organization works. And so these sorts of mechanisms, conversations about them are more critical than ever, especially because um, we're having so many debates right now about pandemic treaties, how to reform international health regulations and understanding what did and didn't go wrong in the face of coronavirus. Um, so we're just waiting a few minutes for, for Mark, who's having a few technical issues, but in the meantime, I'll, I mean, there's no introduction really, but I'll just take you through what to expect from the panel. We've got Karen Wenham, who's the Assistant Professor of Global Health Policy at LSE, and Mark, uh, Mark Eccleston-Turner, a Senior Lecturer in Global Health Law at King's, they're behind the book. Uh, we're also going to hear from Simon Rushton, who is a Professor of International Politics at the University of Sheffield, and Jan Luca Berchi, who is a Professor of International Law at the Graduate, Graduate Institute of Geneva. Um, we're going to hear first from Claire and Mark, and then they'll talk us through the key findings of their books, the ramifications, why you should care. Then we'll hear some feedback thoughts from Simon and Jan Luca before a Q&A. So please, please put your questions in the Q&A box as we go along. I've got plenty, but I'm sure you have too, and they're probably far more interesting and insightful. Um, if you're on Twitter as well, get involved. Uh, there's a hashtag, hashtag age of health for posts about the event. Um, I think we'll just wait a moment, see if Mark can join or- He's here. Uh, oh, he's here, Mark, welcome, great. Okay, well, I'm gonna pass over to Mark and Claire then uh, to give a bit of an overview about the book um, and then we'll go into the Q&A and discussion. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening, uh, particularly Mark, who about a minute ago I thought wasn't going to make it, and I was suddenly panicking that I was going to have to talk for longer than I had planned. Um, it's great to have so many people attend this event, and what we wanted to do was uh, talk a bit about you know, the motivation for the book and where our argument has come from before handing over to our esteemed uh, panellists to uh, give us their input. So really, this uh, book came about as a series of text messages between uh, Mark and I over the course of a couple of years of just being a bit frustrated with the current way that the IHR and fake, the fake mechanism was working. And we took it upon ourselves to try and write this out uh, in a more um, uh, polite and formalized manner than our text messages. And so this is what the, the book has resulted in. To give a bit of background, I'm sure many on this call know much, you know, know plenty about where this has come from. But the fake, the public health emergency of international concern, is a key part of the international health regulations, which is the main legal framework that the, that the World Health Organization has to prevent, detect, and respond to emerging inf infectious diseases. The fake, in particular, is designed and sort of came about historically. Uh, in the post-SARS era. During SARS, for those of you who aren't familiar with the story, what happened was the WHO took unprecedented ac action to call out states, to, to uh, you know, move beyond how many states thought they should. And so actually in the, the negotiations and the renegotiations that happened for the international health regulations post-SARS in 2005, one of the key areas was to try and introduce a, a depoliticized action or, or, or mechanism in the fake for a clear technical guidance on when WHO might be able to start uh, taking such unprecedented action and actually trying to rein in WHO through this mechanism. So what we found quite interesting was something which has been designed to be an apolitical tool to try and give structure and sort of technocratic decision making to the World Health Organization has really fallen into, a, into being a politicized mechanism within the IHR. And what Mark and I have, will talk about in this book is basically how this legal mechanism becomes a political tool and where we kind of see this ambiguity between these two parts. And so what we wanted to look at and is kind of, you know, how has the fake been used to date by the World Health Organization? And then a kind of latterly, how are governments responding to that? How are different actors responding to that? 
And so what we wanted to do and what we did was basically trace the history of the fake, trace all the different outbreaks, looking at them from you know, how have they been justified? How have the decision make, how's the decision making process been looked at? How has that then led to different recommendations for different governments? <clears throat> and really try and unpack this sort of tension that we see between the law and politics. And so really the question we ask is around ambiguity. We ask, why is it that there isn't uh, a, why is it if there's a set formula for how to interpret a fake, which Mark will go on to talk about in a minute, why do we not see that being applied consistently in the different epidemics that we've seen uh, and, and pandemics we've seen since the introduction of the fake in 2005? And what we argue is that there's a huge amount of ambiguity and actually there isn't this kind of people, the, the, the World Health Organization, the Emergency Committee, the Director General are not abiding by the strict criteria and therefore this politicization is happening. And what we then try and ask uh, to argue and ask is why does this matter? Why does it matter if we have this ambiguity and what are the risks of this ambiguity, not only as a kind of academic exercise, but actually, what does this mean uh, more broadly that we'll come on to talk about later on for the IHR, the, the legitimacy of the IHR and the legitimacy of WHO more generally, if there is this ambiguity within this small niche instrument? I'm going to hand over to Mark. So, thank you very much, um, Claire. As Claire just um, set out there, the, the fake is, is key to the global response to, to health emergencies and it's the one of the predominant features of the IHR and I'm going to talk a little bit about about what a fake is and about the role of the the two key actors which we really looked at in our in our book that of the the role of the director general in the declaration of a fake um, and the the role of the the emergency committee um, under the the international health regulations so a fake, a public health emergency of international concern is defined in Article 1 of the IHR. And it, the uh, Article 1 sets out that it has three criteria. It must be an extraordinary event. It must be an extraordinary event which constitutes a public health risk to other states through the international spread of disease. And it must potentially require a coordinated international response. Now, any health emergency can be a fake. Um, the mechanism is not limited by origin or source of the event in question. So when it, they were initially drafted, it was envisaged that this wouldn't just include natural disease events, but potentially chemical or radionuclear um, events. So it's quite a broad um, categorization, quite a broad um, definition of, of the events that we're dealing with here. Now, the, the, how a fake gets declared is set out in the international health regulations. And, and as I said, it has two key actors as part of it. First is the director general of the WHO, and the second is the emergency committee of the IHR. And it's the role of the director general to determine whether an event is a public health emergency of international concern or not. And the IHR are quite clear on the criteria by which the, the director general must do this. It says that they that the DG should consider information provided by the government in question, the decision making instrument, the advice of the emergency committee, scientific principles, other relevant information and so on. So it's very clear that the DG retains discretion and autonomy as to whether a fake is declared or not. They're free to determine if and when an emergency committee is convened. They're free to disregard the advice of the emergency committee if they wish, although no director general has to date. Um, and there are several checks and balances um, within the, the international health regulations um, to act as a check and balance to sort of control this quite significant discretionary power that the international health regulations gives the director general. Um, and as, as Claire alluded to there, the, the IHR and the, the fake in particular is, is a reflection of, the, of what happened in SARS, where, where um, the Director General at the time, um, Director General Brutland, took unprecedented steps to issue travel um, restrictions and to attempt to limit the spread of SARS. And she did so without an express legal mandate. And in doing so, for some governments, she caused significant economic disruption and over 
overstepped her prescribed mandate and her legal authority. So in creating the international health regulations, member states were quite clear to create a process um, that would prevent this sort of what they viewed as arbitrary overreach of power by the director general. So the process is central to the declaration of a fake. But as our book shows, the procedure that's been utilized by the Director General has been inconsistently applied across a number of health emergencies. And there appears to be a number of uh, occasions where the Director General has validated improper criteria and um, when making the decision of, of whether to declare an, uh, a public health emergency or not. And much of that inconsistency has focused around the role of the emergency committee. Because while it's up to the director general who has the ultimate decision as to whether to declare a fake or not, in making this decision, the director general quite heavily relies on the advice of the emergency committee. And despite the fact that advice from the EC is just one of a range of factors that the director general is to take into account, it appears that in practice, um, the central factor when deciding to declare a public health emergency or not is the advice of the emergency committee. No director general has ever disregarded this advice. And um, even when that advice appears illogical or incorrect, as we argue in our book, and you know, so central is the emergency committee to the fake declaration process that it's now common practice for the chair of the emergency committee to co-host the press conference that follows a, direct, uh, a declaration with the director general. But according to the IHR, the Emergency Committee has a quite limited prescribed mandate. They are to advise the Director General as to whether that legal criteria set out at Article 1 has been met or not, and to advise the Director General on what action WHO should take in respect of issuing temporary recommendations. However, what we argue in our, in our book is that there's significant inconsistency in how these in criteria are interpreted and applied by different um, emergency committees. And in some instances, the Director General unnecessary, unnecessarily frustrates the declaration process by failing to convene an emergency committee when it's quite clear that the criteria to do so are met. In others, the decision-making process and procedures vary from emergency committee to emergency committee. In some instances, they add in additional criteria or substitute out additional criteria they, don't, um, they do not like, um, resulting in an inconsistent application of the rules. And in particular, some emergency committees appear to take into account political considerations that are reserved for the Director General. Such inconsistency in procedure, rules and practice, we argue, has implications for wider good governance of the WHO and the normative authority of the institution. And we should be quite clear, we're not against politics being in the, the fake declaration process. This is a political decision. But those political factors need to be taken into account by a political actor in a transparent manner. A director general can be held to account for their political decision making. We have the World Health Assembly, the executive board. Members can refuse to re-elect a director general if they think they use their powers incorrectly. That's why the political factors are embedded in the role of the director general, not the emergency committee. What we currently have, we argue, is political factors being taken into account by a body with no political control over their work, no political expertise, and no mandate for this political role. And our book argues that each of these problems, which have been present across multiple health emergencies, have occurred because multiple director generals have failed to fully appreciate the fake as a tool in global health security, and fail to appreciate the normative and legal authority of the processes in the IHR. And our concern is that in doing so, they've undermined the fake, they've undermined the IHR, and they've undermined global health governance. If we're going to have a rules-based international order in global health, that starts with WHO upholding their own rules. And I'll hand back to Sarah there, or Claire. Oh, Claire, you're on mute. So we were going to give you a couple of examples of how we see this tension emerging between the <clears throat> legal criteria that Mark's alluded to and the politicization and the political facts that come in. So one of these examples is the declaration of a fake for polio. Now, this was a uh, this started in 2014. And so far, there have been over 30 meetings of the emergency committee for polio. It has to happen every three months under the IHR. 
And each one of these has agreed that it remains a public health emergency of international concern. But when we look at this, in, we look in detail at all the statements that have come out of these emergency committees, of all the further discussion that we've seen amongst EC members through publications, for example, we don't think it meets the criteria of fake. The main one being it's not unexpected or extraordinary, which is the kind of first thing that we should be looking at in a fake. You know, polio has been around for centuries. It's not unexpected that's going to emerge. In the places it emerges, it is not unexpected. But yet we see this the, the careful language being put into statements around the word extraordinary, right? We see statements being put in around uh, spread, uh, international spread across land borders, referring to the border, the, the, the area between Pakistan and Afghanistan in particular as the kind of risk of international spread. So we see, we, as we argue, some stretching of the legal terminologies for political reasons. And what we see in here is not only this, this um, you know, trying to stretch the legal definition because they want this or because they, they believe there's a purpose to this, but we also see the emergency committing, the committee adding in further definitions for why polio is a, a public health emergency of international concern. So, for example, they argue that uh, a justification for the fake declaration is because where we see polio emerging is in weak health systems and conflict-ridden locations. We also see that they a justification for the fake being uh, a broader risk or not maintaining the fake is a broader risk to global eradication efforts. Now, we think this is important because two, it tells us two things. First of all, it tells us that... Um, there is a uh, that, that, that the emergency committee and the WHO and the DG believe there's a normative power to the fake. They think there is some purpose for keeping the fake for polio as it is having some sort of you know profile raising agenda or getting it more attention than it might otherwise have. But importantly, these aren't the criteria that are that are set out in the IHR and by which a fake should be governed. It, fake is not a tool of eradication and nor is it is a, a tool of agenda raising. We also argue that maybe this is that there's a political reason behind this. We might say, for example, that there was, um, you know, we know, for example, that there have been reductions in money for polio eradication efforts. Is raising the agenda and making it a fake, is that a way of trying to get more money into it? We also know that there's a, there's a very difficult um, or ambiguous relationship between the funding going into polio in the World Health Organization, up to 17 billion in recent years, uh, and the need to maintain this, because actually the WHO depends on a lot of that money for a lot of other activity. And so we're seeing this politicization of the, the fake in the polio mandate. But perhaps the most interesting way we see around how this, is, how this manifests is in what has been declared to be the fake. So in 2014, when the fake for polio was first declared, it was for wild type polio. Now, subsequently, during the process of tracing the, um, the emergency state and the emergency committee statement, we see that actually wild polio becomes less of an issue. And actually now the one of the key issues for the emergency committee is vaccine derived polio. And the irony of this obviously is that the temporary recommendations that were given by the emergency committee to manage wild type polio was to get vaccinated and increase vaccination. And now that in itself is being considered to be a, a, a fake in itself. I'm going to pass over to Mark to discuss another case study. Thanks, Claire. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about Ebola and then um, COVID. So the Ebola outbreak in the in the DRC occurred in, in 2019. <clears throat> Um, the uh, government of the DRC very rapidly discharged its obligations under IHR to notify WHO of potential fake in its territory, but the Director General didn't convene an emergency committee until um, three months later in October. At that meeting, the, the emergency committee recognised that the criteria to declare were met. They said on several occasions there was very high risk of regional spread, response activities need to be um, intensified, um, the, um, and uh, and that the outbreak was extraordinary um, because of the very high case fatality rate. And despite this, the emergency committee in that on that meeting advised that a fake should not be declared at this time. Now, this was very unusual and very interesting language. It's markedly different from all previous meetings of the emergency committee up until that point, in which. Um, the emergency committee state that either 
the conditions for a fake are not currently met or the event doesn't constitute a fake. But this change in language is indicative of the, that the, the advice given on the October 2018 Emergency Committee was not grounded in the IHR. They, may, they added in this, this additional criteria that, that said, despite the fact the criteria are met, we don't think you should declare at this time. And the Director General endorsed that decision and did not declare fake. The, the Emergency Committee took an even more unusual interpretation in June um, 2019, which was the next um, uh, one of the later meetings. Uh, 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 sorry, um, in April 2019, the, the Emergency Committee advised against the fake deep being declared because, in their words, there is no added benefit to declaring a fake at this stage. Now, that is not part of the um, criteria at all. Um, and we have no idea why they think um, that that was the case. They further said that a fake did not need to be declared because there had not been international spread at that point. Now, this is a key misunderstanding that the emergency committee had around the criteria. There doesn't need to be cross-border spread in order to, be, to declare a fake, but there must be risk of cross-border spread, which there certainly was, and the committee recognized that. And indeed, this was the case with the resurgence of polio, which, which Claire alluded to. There was no cross-border spread at the point that fake was declared, but there was a risk of it, according to the committee, and they declared with polio, but not with Ebola in the DRC. And indeed, the idea that you would wait for a disease to spread across borders before you take action is, is ridiculous. You, you take action to prevent cross-border spread. The June 2019 meeting was even more unusual because the emergency committee said, while this is an extraordinary event, there is a risk of international spread, the ongoing response in the DRC wouldn't be enhanced by formal temporary recommendations under the IHR. Um, the idea that a coordinated international response, which is what the IHR talks about, means recommendations is quite an unusual one. And bizarrely during, um, um, the, the, the outbreak was eventually declared a, a fake one month later, um, and the only thing that had really changed between that June meeting where they said this isn't a fake and the meeting in July was the presence of one case in Goma, which is a large um, city in the DRC close to the Rwandan border. This was apparently enough to satisfy the EC that the fake criteria were now met because now a coordinated international response was required. This is quite bizarre and the farcical deliberations for the emergency committee for Ebola in the DRC is quite is probably the best example of our underpinning argument that executive power being improperly exercised leads to absurd results and it's quite clear with the emergency committee for the DRC that the EC acted outside of its legal authority it took into account explicit political decisions when determining whether the criteria were, were met which is well beyond its role and it did so with very little evidence there was no evidence that temporary recommendations were required there's no evidence that um the 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 um the response wouldn't be made better with a fake because and that isn't even part of the the criteria but the fault for this doesn't lie solely at the door of the emergency committee blame must also go to the director general and the who secretariat who in accepting the recommendations from the ec which were laid before them the director general at the time endorsed its erroneous reasoning it endorsed its incorrect decision and it in, and he endorsed the improper role of the ec by not just disregarding these recommendations and overruling and declaring a fake because it was quite clear to everyone that the, the decision that the declaration were met the director general failed to properly ensure that the ihr were implemented and um, by who and to be clear the role of the emergency committee is to give the director general advice but it's just advice the director general can disregard it and declare a fake against the emergency committee's recommendations and by failing to do so with Ebola in the DRC the director general endorsed this expanded role of the emergency committee beyond their mandate and then accepting their logic that a fake would not enhance or improve the response in the DRC and in actual fact could make things worse the director general that agreed that an international legal instrument negotiated by the World Health Organization, which has its center 
has this exercise in executive power by the director general was at best ineffective and at worst was actively harmful to states in their response to a health emergency. This is a bizarre decision and a bizarre thing for a director general of the World Health Organization to endorse. So I'll move on just to talk about Ebola in the DR, uh, talk about COVID. Um, a very specific point of COVID, because I'm sure we're all quite thick, uh, quite sick of, of talking and hearing about COVID right now. I want to take us right back to the very beginning of the outbreak, where the first emergency committee meeting for COVID-19 was held on the 22nd of January in 2020, and there was a rapid escalation um, given the, the number of unknown um, uh, quantities um, from when China initially notified um, the World Health Organization in December of 2019. Now, according to the emergency committee statement from the first meeting, there was a divergence of views whether COVID should be declared a fake at this point. The EC even held a vote, which resulted in a tie. Um, with an, uh, and a member of the emergency committee later said that there was no consensus whether this event met the criteria to be declared a, a fake or not. And it's quite interesting that they talked about their governance processes um, within, the, within the, the meeting. So this requirement of there being a consensus of how to, of, to declare a, a fake is, is not in the IHR. It's at the discretion of each of the emergency committees as to how it comes to its decision um, as to what recommendations to make. But the lack of transparency in the fake declaration process means that there's no consistency of approach between meetings. So we don't know if the emergency committees for COVID followed the same processes as the emergency committees for Ebola or for polio or for 2009 H1N1. But this early decision um, where, where, WH, where the emergency committee said that they could not reach a decision um, uh, for many is, is a, is, was an error, and it was quite clear that even at that stage, the criteria to declare a fake were met. Um, and there are concerns that um, there were political considerations um, hindering the, the, the decision. And the Director General actually requested that the, the, the emergency committee meet again the following day to try and reach a conclusion. So it's quite clear that um, Dr. Tedros felt that he couldn't make a decision without the emergency committee giving a formal recommendation. Um, and as we know, the emergency, the director general doesn't go against the advice which is given by an emergency committee. So they met the following day and they advised that this was not a fake yet. But they noted that this was an urgent and they said that we, this was an urgent event. We need to meet again in a few days to, to, um, to assess the situation again. There, conclusion was predicated on the fact that there wasn't uh, sufficient data and that the scale of the, the outbreak was quite small at that stage. But it's quite interesting that a lack of data wasn't a barrier to declaring a fake during Zika um, a few years earlier, which comes back again to this point of inconsistency between emergency committees in how they interpret and apply the criteria. Um, Division within the emergency committee in these meetings seems to have centered around the idea of international spread, that one of those criteria from Article 1. Um, at the time, all known cases outside of China were direct travel, um, were individuals who appeared to be infected in China then traveled internationally. And therefore, some argued that this was not international spread, but this is at odds with the IHR um, and the way that the criteria has been applied. Uh, interpreted and applied um, in other outbreaks and ignores that idea of, of risk. Um, the, the, um, it was very clear at this stage that the criteria were met, but again, they, 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 they recommended that, we, that a declaration wasn't met. The emergency committee met again a week later, and at this point, there'd been a significant increase in cases and countries reporting cases, and the EC recommended that it was a fake. And they believed that a declaration would help facilitate um, interrupting the virus's spread and that a coordinated international response was needed. What's noticeable from this was the express concern of the emergency committee and the, and the WHO in general as to how China would view the declaration. The committee emphasized in their decision that the declaration should be seen in the spirit of support and appreciation for China, its people, and the action that China had taken on the front lines of this outbreak. Um, 
And in the accompanying press conference, the, the director general made it clear that the fake declaration was not because of the outbreak in China, but was to act as a call of support for low and middle income countries to prepare for a potential outbreak on the assumption that they'd be less able to do so than China, um, a sentiment which has been echoed in subsequent meetings of the emergency committee. And these statements seem to indicate the extent to which political considerations appear to have influenced both the emergency committee's recommendations and the actions of the director general. One suggestion might be that there was that, that the, the Chinese delegation to the World Health Organization may have been resistant to, to a declaration being made, um, but due to the lack of transparency as to what goes on in the room when the emergency committee meets, we do not have enough data to know whether this occurred. A second suggestion that might be, regardless of the Chinese participation in the emergency committee meetings, the director general was concerned as to how China would view a declaration and that they would be drawn into a diplomatic standoff um, between WHO and China at a point where WHO was keen to keep an open dialogue with China, particularly around cases and monitoring of the virus. Um, and that there was fear that China could view a fake declaration as a hostile act and um, result in China refusing to engage in sharing further data um, around the virus, given what happened during the, the SARS outbreak. So those are the, the three sort of case, um, main case studies which we wanted to, to draw out, which really demonstrate some of our concerns with how this instrument has been, been bastardized over a number of, of um, outbreaks over a number of years. Um, and we think that they demonstrate quite clearly the, the argument which, which we try to make in the, in, the, the, um, in the book, which is that there is a, a governance failure here um, by WHO, um, in particular by members of the emergency committee, but that, that has been in erroneously endorsed by the WHO secretariat and the director general over several years and several director generals. So I think that brings to an end the, the bit that um, Claire and I wanted to say, and we'll hand back to Sarah now, I believe. Can I jump in on one thing, Mark? I think there's one other thing that we should add on here, which is kind of why this matters. Because, you know, we can talk about the, um, you know, the, the minutiae of international law or the kind of why does it matter between whether it's the EC saying something or the Director General saying something or at what point in an outbreak a, pan, a fake is declared. But, but I think what we also try and show in this book is that, that there is a kind of bigger picture here. Right. And this matters because there's clearly the fake is clearly a normative tool. It clearly has some sort of power that people are, you know, say, oh, well, it was declared a fake. Now we can come on to talk about that, you know, whether it matters now in the wake of, of the, the pandemic language. But there clearly has been historically this kind of weight associated with the declaration. But what we try and argue is that kind of the, the inconsistency of the process actually negates the power of the tool itself, right? And actually you see, if you're seeing this ambiguity and this lack of consistency of the legal interpretation and the legal application of the, the IHR and the decision-making, that this is a problem. And we argue this is a problem because if you're inconsistent in how you apply the fake, and if the WHO, as the organization which governs the IHR and governs the fake, is inconsistent in how it applies this, this gives a carte blanche to not to, to you know broader inconsistencies with the IHR. If the very body that is saying these are the rules you've got to follow, don't follow them, then governments and states can then you know have greater space to um, you know depart from the IHR. We think that's a problem. We think it's a risk to global health security that actually if there's there's you know greater precedent, and I'm sure I'm using the wrong legal terms here, and Gianluca and Mark will, will, will chastise me, but if there's greater precedent for not abiding by the rules within the organization, then governments are then gonna you know, keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And we think that at a time when what we need and what we, what we need is more compliance with the IHR, and more compliance with whatever might come next in the wake of COVID, that actually getting these fundamental rights is really important. And we also argue that there might have a broader impact of, of, this, of this inconsistency and ambiguity of the fake for actually the role of the WHO. And if you want to have a strong, powerful WHO, it has to make sure that it is you know, doing what it said it's going to do and not, giving, not opening any doors or any option for governments to shoot it down and say, you haven't done this or you're doing this wrong. And so we think it also adds broader tensions around the, the legitimacy of the WHO more broadly in global health security, which is why we think something which sounds so niche and just one article in the IHR is actually so much more important 
for that sort of global health security much more broadly. Thanks, Claire. I think that's a really good summation of, of what you guys have just said. Um, I've got lots of questions and we've got some really good ones coming in that I wish I'd thought of. But before we launch into that, um, Gianluca, we'd love to hear your response uh, to the ideas that Claire and Mark have shared. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Claire and Mark. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and what you said obviously raises a quite a number of questions. Um, also, Sarah didn't mention it, but before playing academic, I was uh, for many years the legal counsel of WHO. So I was part of the team that revised the IHR. I sat in many emergency committee on the H1N1 flu, on Ebola, on polio, on the beginning of Zika. So in a way, uh, I know things that I cannot disclose <laughs> on the one hand. Um, certain things touch me personally, obviously, but I, I totally see the the legitimacy of your concern. So I would like to make, um, I, won't take, I won't take long, but a, a few remarks, maybe sort of playing around what you said. The first is, how did we get this idea of a fake into the IHR? There is a history behind. Uh, and the history came from the obsolescence of the old IHR, what David Fiedler called the classic uh, model or regime or something. Uh, based on a, um, a rather passive uh, frame of a uh, rigid system of, of maximum measures, a list of diseases, rather passive role of WHO and so on. And that clearly failed. And it took 10 years to find a different model. And so the idea of public health emergency came out during that period. It was something that the Secretariat actually <clears throat> worked on for quite a while with a number of external partners, but it was really because uh, they couldn't find anything better. They try a system based on the reporting of syndrome and it failed. So we should verify the fake as it, it's the ultimate model that cannot be changed. And they, that goes to the heart of what you're saying. In a way, the fake is an experiment in trying to find a workable operational model to do certain things that help states uh, and that, uh, you know, try to, 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 to achieve a measure of coordination and so on. But, uh, and, and I come to that later, uh, it's, not the, it's, not, it's not the end of the story and shouldn't be seen the end of the story. And what you said clearly shows the, uh, the flaws and the limits in, in, in that model. But that model in a way uh, responds also to the fact as uh, I believe uh, Mark said, that the IHR are an innovative instrument because they really embody the globalization of risk. Uh, risk doesn't only come from the natural spread of pathogens, it can come from terrorism, it can come from accidents and so on. And so you needed a, some kind of model that could encompass very, very different causes of diseases and very, very different scenarios of transmission and scenarios of risk assessment and risk management. So the fake had a logic in a way, besides having been a reaction, if you want, to what happened during SARS and the need to somehow codify and regulate the exercise of emergency powers by uh, the, the WHO Secretariat, which is quite unusual, I would say extraordinary in, in uh, among international organization. The second point is, so what is a fake about? The fake in a way, um, Armin von Bogdandi and Pedro Villarreal, who I think is listening to us, called it um, governance by information. Um, the effects of a fake are quite limited. And that to me is part of the problem. It unleashed, it unlocks the authority of the director general to issue recommendations, but little more. So the purpose was really alert, was the exercise of an epistemic authority. So you say you call it normative in a way. It's, it, it generates certain effects and definitely to govern through information. Now, the, the problem lies here in a way in which this authority has been exercised, because as you correctly noted, there has been since the very beginning, since H1N1, a reversal of the roles. Um, in a way, the, what happens at that point in the governance of the IHR is risk assessment. So what's going on? What do we know? And on the base of that, risk management, what we do about it and what states should do about it. The emergency committee still plays the risk assessor role, gives an input to the director general that manages the risk. And risk management is a political function. So 
I agree that that's, in a way, the tension at the heart of the IHR. The states wanted, and I think on purpose, and I think legitimately, a depoliticized way to manage health emergency. And what better way to give it to an impartial technical secretariat. But risk management is fundamentally political. And so where do we go from here? So I haven't read your book and I'm certainly going to, I don't know whether besides making a diagnosis of the governance failure, you also try to propose what next? Because diagnosis are important to make a prognosis. What is the medicine? What is the, uh, the, 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 the changes that can improve the, the situation? But going back to what I was saying, there's clearly been a, for political reasons, in a way, self-protection for the director general hiding behind the emergency committee. The emergency committee has become the risk manager. Whatever it says becomes the fake or not, or becomes the policy statement by the director general. That to me is the, the, the thing that has fundamentally gone wrong. And what you said about COVID, Mark, proves the point because the director general did not want to take a decision with a split emergency committee. He needed a consensus in a way to endorse whatever the committee was coming up with. So there it's something that definitely has to change. To be fair, if you look at the reports of the emergency committee back in 2009 and 10, and you look at them now, they have improved. So there are certain lessons have been learned. I know you don't like, Mark, that the committee hides meets behind closed doors. We had conversation about it. I think there is, frankly, it's useful. There is a certain shielded from public scrutiny. But obviously, there is a need to improve methods of work. There has been work being done actually on that. But sometimes it's overtaken by the emergency at the moment. And, and, and it's interesting the states don't really weigh on that. Uh, and that's another point. So if there has been a governance failure, if there has been an improper use of the authority of the director general of the organization, why aren't states in the executive board in the health assembly making the director general accountable? They shoot across the bow uh, from a diplomatic perspective or just to shoot at each other using the director general as a tool as in the case of COVID. But you haven't seen much institutionalized reaction within the governance of WHO. So it'd be interesting to wonder why and whether it's going to change. And so where do we go from here in a way? Because um, I don't necessarily agree with all you said, but definitely there has been a governance failure, which is not only a failure of individuals, of in a way of the politics, but probably the limits of the instrument that was packaged very quickly. It was revised in a year and a half, which for something of this complexity is incredibly fast. When you do it so fast, there are mistakes and mistakes can be fixed. So, and should be fixed. So, again, I don't know whether you, you, um, you deal with that. Maybe it's difficult because things are moving right now. But do we, do we have an opportunity now to try to fix this? And how? As you know, we have this um, labor, this very laborious discussion on the pandemic treaty, but there is also an exercise on strengthening the IHR. Countries like the United States are very strong that they should take priority, actually. And so, how can we fix it? Do we need the fake? Uh, I personally went on record to uh, not to like this binary system. Um, and that also, I don't like the term emergency. It is so loaded, so fraught, so politically dangerous. Look how it's been abused all over the place as an instrument of oppression. Uh, do we need that? Can states be treated as grown ups? and be given proper information, proper risk analysis, and recommendation. Um, I know you don't like the traffic light. There can be other systems. But I wonder whether we need to look, besides how this particular uh, way to manage emergency has been exercised, we, we need to look more deeply. Do we need that? Is there a better system? And is there a better system that should be politicized more? There should be a role for states. States, on purpose, are taking a backseat. They kept all the freedom under Article 43, which is part of the problem. But when it comes to manage, to decentralized management of an emergency, they're really taken themselves out of the picture. Should they be back into the picture? And how and how much? Because I like a system where you have a certain centralization of information and guidance and so on. <clears throat> and that, in my view, that shouldn't be lost. 
but should there be a, an element to repoliticization uh, in a way to give justice to what you said, that all this is fundamentally political. It's an illusion to treat it as something clinical, mechanical, where you check the boxes. And inconsistencies of how it's been done proves the point that it's been a political exercise. So I'm raising more questions maybe than, than making comments, but I hope it can help and also help in the, the Q&A. Many thanks. Yeah, Luca, I think you've raised a lot of the questions that I've wanted to ask. That makes me feel a bit validated. Um, but before we dive into them, Simon, let's hear your thoughts. Um, and we've also got questions coming in, keep them coming. Great, thanks, Sarah. And I'm glad we agreed that Gianluca would go first, because I think what I want to say follows actually nicely from, from where he ended. Um, and I'm certainly not going to engage in uh, talking about the kind of technical inner workings of WHO, which I'm the person in this Zoom room who knows least about. Um, so I suppose what I want to talk about are the broader political consequences of, of the declaration of a public health emergency of international concern. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to say a big congratulations to, to Claire and Mark on the book, which I have had the opportunity to see, and, and it's a really fascinating piece of work. There's, there's been a lot of very fast books that have come out during the COVID pandemic, um, for better or worse. You know, I think Zizek, I think, has written a whole shelf full. Um, but Claire's and Mark's is one that's, that's really worth reading and that is interdisciplinary in the best sense. You know, this is a legal scholar and a scholar from, from international relations coming together to look at, as, as Gianluca just really neatly explained, this issue which is inherently both legal and, and political. And I think that that brings a really nice um, kind of set of perspectives and skills. So I definitely encourage you to, uh, to read the book. It's not a, it's not a dry technical book, um, it has that really detailed legal analysis, but it also does a really nice job, I think, of drawing out the, the wider um, ramifications of this. So I think, first of all, congratulations on the book. And I just wanted to, to talk about two things. Um, and the first is where, where Gianluca was going at the end of his comments, which is thinking about this word emergency and what calling something an emergency does. And that's inherent in, in this whole mechanism, right? This mechanism is an official declaration of something as, as being a public health emergency of, of international concern. And as Claire and Mark rightly say in the book, and they said earlier, that is to some extent about the application of, of legal criteria. And it's to some extent a kind of empirical finding of, of fact, but it's also, a declaration that has a political import, right? And and Claire used this word normative, and I think that's um, that's a word that crops up in the book as well. This isn't, in many ways, a kind of call to arms to states, right? This this declaration is is the WHO saying to states, "Hey, you need to wake up. You need to look at this outbreak that's happening that may not yet have made it to your territory, but as Mark told us, is of potential international significance, and you need to prepare." And you need to prepare in a way which is cooperative, right? We need the world to work together and the WHO to be a coordinating mechanism in doing that. And I wonder, this is a question, I suppose, for Claire and Mark um, to pick up on later, whether declaring something emergency actually generates the kind of cooperation that we would really like to see. Now, in principle, of course, we would, we would hope that it would, especially for something like a pandemic, right, in which every state in the world is is implicated we would like to think that 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 emergency declaration would trigger the kind of cooperative action that that the ihr foresee and i suppose i would argue that often it doesn't um and i think we've seen that during covid and we've seen that during previous health emergencies as well governments over the last 20 years or so have increasingly come to see diseases, not just as being health problems to be solved, but as threats to their national security. And when threats to their national security are potential, then very often they talk nicely about cooperating to deal with those things and working internationally and so on. When those threats to their national security become immediate, when something becomes an emergency, what we very often see in international relations is a turning inwards, right? Is a, is a self-protection mechanism kicking in. Uh, is a desire to use whatever tools might be at their disposal to protect themselves and to protect their populations. And we've seen that during COVID with um, the rapid rolling out of border measures, for example, um, which was not what WHO was recommending. We've seen that in a, in a kind of non-IHR 
um, setting to the prioritization of by rich countries of their own populations for vaccines, right? So very often when we call something an emergency and that triggers these kinds of national security uh, reactions, we don't see the kind of cooperation that the WHO wants and that the IHR are, are designed um, to provide. Now, of course, I'm not trying to say that the WHO was wrong to declare COVID um, a public health emergency of international concern, right? It's not, I'm not kind of criticizing them for, for shouting fire in the theater, right? The, the theater was on fire. I think there's no, no doubt about that. But sometimes when you shout fire, you know, you don't get the kind of orderly evacuation that you want. What you get is people scrambling to be first for the exit and uh, some people in the process being trampled in the aisles and all those kinds of unfortunate things. So uh, one of the questions I suppose is, do you think the emergency language can be a problem uh, in terms of leading to that kind of self-defense um, approach? And can you think of a, either better mechanisms or better language that might encourage a more cooperative response to uh, emerging threats. I think that's a, a big challenge, um, which is not for you to solve necessarily, but I think it is a big challenge. So that's the first thing I wanted to talk about was, was emergency. And the second thing I wanted to talk about um, was the future, which also um, Gianluca talked about a little bit and everybody in, on this call will know, I'm sure that there's a whole range of different lessons learning uh, mechanisms and, and processes ongoing at the moment. There's a whole range of different proposals floating around for new global health treaties, for IHR revisions, um, whatever those things might be. And it seems to me, and I'd be really interested, especially to hear Mark's perspective on this as, as an international lawyer, that all of those are going to run up against the same problem that the IHR run up against, which is not a uniquely health law problem this is an international law problem this is that for the most part we have no effective way of enforcing international law um that if we did try to create effective ways of enforcing it, it probably wouldn't be acceptable to states because they don't want to bind themselves and find themselves um uh being forced to do things they don't want to do in future and especially when they see their really vital national interests being at stake, they're the cases where states are arguably least likely to comply with, with things that they've committed to previously. So we end up in really hard cases like global pandemics where states might have in, if I can use the word peacetime, agreed that they would behave in certain ways. But then when the emergency hits, suddenly they don't want to do that anymore. And this is, of course, uh, an age-old problem of international law. It's one that's, that's certainly not unique to the IHR, but it's one that seems really hard to break out of um, in terms of thinking about the future, thinking what a, what a better governance arrangement um, for encouraging cooperation during pandemics might look like. Now, I can see, I've seen that Adam Kamrat Scott's on this call and several years ago, he and I and, and our other colleague, Sarah Davis, wrote, um, wrote a book where we tried to think about what future compliance with the IHR might look like. And of course, now that's laughably naive and optimistic and we can all um, talk about how wrong we were and, uh, and so on. But I still think there might be something salvageable in, in some of the ideas that we put forward in, in that book. And we were quite optimistic there that of course we wouldn't see perfect compliance with the IHR, but what we might see gradually over time might be an increase in levels of compliance as this became a kind of routine uh, part of, of the way states deal with each other, as these mechanism, mechanisms become more kind of bureaucratized and less heavily politicized, that actually what we might see gradually over time um, are governments kind of automatically or through path dependency becoming more and more likely to, to um, abide by their previous commitments even though there's nothing to force them to, even though there's no enforcement action. Um, so this is a kind of norm socialization, let's say, to use the international relations jargon. This is a kind of norm socialization argument. And I've done a lot of reflecting on whether COVID's shown that we were indeed naive and optimistic um, in that book. I might be able to argue and get out of that, I suppose, by arguing just that 
they've not been socialised enough yet. And we were right, but it's just going to be a longer game than, than we maybe initially hoped. Um, but nevertheless, I think what we can think about is what might encourage that process of, of socialisation. If we are not going to have enforcement, and I feel that probably in whatever mechanism enhances or even replaces the IHR, we're probably never going to have uh, enforcement from a body like WHO being able to tell member states what they have to do. What can we do then to encourage compliance? Maybe that's the game. Maybe that's the, the thing that we ought to be discussing. And I think there are some interesting things in Mark and Claire's book, actually. Um, and they talked about some of those. They talked about inconsistency, right? Maybe inconsistency discourages states from complying. And, and Claire said that in her comments at the end, right? If, if WHO isn't going to stick to the things that are written in these regulations, then how can we expect states to? So maybe there is a, a role for for kind of modelling behaviour there. Maybe transparency, which, which Mark and Gianluca, obviously there's, a, there's an interesting uh, argument to be had later here because they, it sounds like they've discussed this before and, and disagree on transparency, but maybe transparency might be a way of, of encouraging and compliance. I was really struck by Gianluca's uh, proposal that maybe we need to treat governments like adults and, and talk to them about risk and not have these binary, yes, this is an emergency. And yeah, I know we told you yesterday it wasn't an emergency, but today it is. Maybe actually we need something that's a little bit more, more fine grained. So I suppose the question I'm, I'm setting for you, for you and Mark here, Claire, is um, if we can't enforce compliance and it's likely that we're never going to be, to be able to enforce compliance, what can WHO do to encourage it? Right. What can what can they do to try and try and uh, push along this this norm socialization process, trying to try and persuade states if they can't force them to act in ways that are cooperative um, and that will help us deal collectively as a world with these big shared challenges. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, wow, I'm going to do something really annoying for academics and ask you when we do the questions to try and keep your answers brief because we have got so much to get through, which is fantastic. Um, but actually, let's start with that question that you just posed, I think, Simon, it's a good place to kick off. Um, how do you get governments to follow these instruments? One thing that I've been really struck with, and it fits back with the language issue, is, I mean, in the newsroom and certainly lots of some of the initial um, you know, feedback that have been from the I, international panel on all of this stuff is no one did anything until they said pandemic anyway. I know that my colleagues weren't that bothered until they said pandemic. I couldn't get anyone to work out what a fake was in the newsroom. So it, it fits in. There's this whole compliance issue. There's this language issue. Claire, what do you think are some of the solutions around that? How can we get people to take this stuff seriously? And, and does that involve having a, a different approach to, you know, it's not an emergency or it is an emergency? What, what's your thoughts on that? Thanks, um, uh, Sarah, Simon, Gianluca. I mean, lots to <coughs> unpack and think about there. <coughs> I guess, so, I mean, I agree with you, Simon, thinking about next steps and kind of, you know, whatever this looks like, whether it's um, IHR+, plus, whether it's a pandemic treaty, whether it's something else, who knows? Um, you know, that is the central question, right? Which is how do you get governments to respond, prevent, you know, work together, the, the, the language is banded about around solidarity and equity, which I think is even less likely to get in there. Um, you know, but all these things come down to the same question, which is how do you get governments to do something? And I agree with Simon that you're never going to get governments to agree now to have sanctions placed on them if they misbehave in future. Like <clears throat> That's just never going to happen. Governments won't sign up to it. So if sanctions are off, then I think the logical um, next step is you've got to incentivize it. You've got to incentivize compliance. You've got to incentivize reporting to WHO. You've got to incentivize what do you do when a fake is declared that steps are taken, right? One of the things that we, we don't do in this book, but would love to do, uh, as, and we've talked about it several times with, with Rebecca Katz and Alexandra Phelan about, you know, having a project on what happens when a fake's declared, what do governments do? At the moment, there's not, there's, we've got no evidence based on actually what happens when that, when that clarion call goes off. But, you know, that's kind of a, a side question. But, you know, the question is, how do you get governments to do something when the fake is declared? How do you get governments to take it seriously? How do you get governments to report and trust in the fake mechanism, trust in the IHR mechanism? And that comes back to, in, to incentives. Now, 
there's different types of incentives at play, right? So you could say, for example, well, money needs to be available, right? When a fake is declared, there needs to be a pot of money that governments can then use to bolster their response system or strengthen their preparedness, depending on what stage of the epidemic you're at in your country. Now that, in theory, or despite all the challenges of financing, could be relatively easy to set up, right? You could you could link it to, to World Bank financing, IMF drawing rights, you know, there's lots of different ways in the in the multilateral system you could do that. The problem though, and I think this is shown more by COVID than anything else, is what about the governments that don't need the money, right? You've got the US, European countries, they don't need money from the World Bank to launch a pandemic preparedness or you know response mechanism. So how do you get them to comply? And I think that's a much more difficult question because, you know, the things that you could do in other fora, like the UN Security Council, WHO hasn't got the power to do. And again, you know, Mark and Gianluca can talk to me more about the legal uh, ramifications of that. And, and states don't care about WHO in the same way they care about other locations. So saying, for example, if you don't comply or you don't take action when a fake is declared, you'll lose your voting rights at WHA. I don't think states are going to care that much. That's not enough of an incentive for UK, for example, to do something. So I think we've got to really think about you know that part about the kind of the richer countries that don't need the money. What's the incentive for them? And how do we we get that in there? Uh, Mark, shall I pass over to you? You can probably disagree with what I'm saying. No, no. Um, so I I think you know I think I think sanctions are off the table for a number of reasons. Number one, they're a terrible idea. Number two, WHO doesn't want to be a sanction. WHO views itself as a technocratic agency that sets standards. It's not an, an, an enforcement agency. Um, and, you know, most sanction regimes are country to country. Most enforcement regimes are about other countries enforcing sanctions. On So, you know, let's say China delayed sharing information under the IHR. Who's going to impose sanctions on China? Who'd impose sanctions on the US if they did something similar? I think it's a, a, a complete non-starter. But I think when you get into the question of compliance, I think you have to start with the question of why don't governments comply? Why do governments not share information with IHR, with WHO when they have legal obligations to do so? It's because they get left out into the cold. They're frozen out of the global, you know, of the global economic system. They're, you know, trade slows down, tourism slows down. That's why governments don't don't comply. It's not that they don't want to comply. It's that they're fearful of the ramifications of complying with their legal obligations. And part of that is 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 actually about IHR itself. The IHR, when you look at when you look at the you know the the purpose of the IHR, it's to prevent, detect, and respond to potential health emergencies. Well, it does prevention and detection quite clearly. Where's the response in IHR? When you declare, when you give notification under Article 6 to, to the World Health Organization that you have a potential outbreak in your territory, you don't get much technical support under the IHR. There's very little built into IHR around technical support. Some technical support might come from WHO Secretariat, but that's highly limited and budget dependent. What you do get is other countries closing their borders to you. So if you're a very low income country who's heavily reliant on trade, heavily reliant on tourism to keep your country afloat, why would you comply with your obligations under IHR? Because when you know what is coming for you if you do that. So we have to look at why they don't comply rather than going, you haven't complied, how do we make you comply? You go, we have to take a step back from that and think about why they don't comply in the first place. Um, sorry. Carry on. I thought you'd finish your thought. I was going to open it up, but keep yeah, going. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll leave it. <laughs> Jan or oh, Simon, do you have any kind of anything to add on the, on this point of compliance and, and what makes countries follow but rules or not? The question of compliance is clearly one of the sort of joys and sorrows of international law. Uh, how do you even conceptualize compliance in a flat legal system where there is no centralized enforcement authority and so on? I am a, with all its limits, I've always been um, intrigued and fascinated by the managerial theory of compliance, a famous book of uh, uh, Abraham and Antonia Chase many years ago. Um, and I, I think that that offers a number of, of, of tools that go along what, um, what, what Simon, Claire, and Mark were saying. Uh, 
create incentives. First of all, accept limits. We are not going to have absolutely perfect system where everybody is expected to comply. That's not how the world works. And power differential will always play a role. The attitude versus Burkina Faso will be different from the attitude versus China. That's a fact of life. Um, do you also have to accept the fact that, and that's one of the points of, of the Chase book, uh, that non-compliance is often not a uh, deliberate political decision not to comply, is an inability to comply because of lack of resources, because of the lack of clarity in the instrument, because of many circumstances. And also the fact that compliance is not a binary, either you have, you cross the line and you are non-compliant and you should be sanctioned. Compliance is a gray area, is a spectrum of gray. And international lawyers and states talk about sufficient compliance, which already says it all. So we need to move within this, um, this concept and, 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 and these constraints. But I personally think that, for example, uh, having a credible accountability mechanism, which the WHR does not have, um, a reporting system, a compliance committee, which is one of the proposals by the United States, by the way, on, on, on amending the IHR. Um, investing in prevention. We shouldn't get to the point where we go into the security syndrome that Simon was very well describing. Um, prevention means against the capacity of a state to detect and prevent, means um, incentivizing very early information sharing, means giving more powers to WHO, uh, to use social media and so on. That's another proposal that is floating around. Um, so the transparency can be used as a weapon, as a as a positive weapon, because states are transparent. I mean, COVID was detected by WHO. It wasn't reported by Beijing to begin with. By WHO office in China monitoring the website of Wuhan. Um, so that says it all. Even in a country as politically and socially controlled as China, health events of a certain magnitude become known one way or the other. And states know it. And so to use that in a way to construe a better system, of, look, you cannot hide. So what are the things that can, in a way, protect you, uh, offer a buffer against overreaction? The IHR was supposed to do that, but it has failed. So that, to me, is a big element of, of reflection for future improvement of the system. But we had to accept the limits. The history of mankind is a history of the failure to control disease. We all glorify the eradication of smallpox. It's the only one. So. We are constantly chasing after the bugs. And we need also, we need ambition, but we need a sense of humility in how much we can, how far we can go, I think. I think that's very true. And I'm, I'm sure there's more to dive into, but let's just shift over to a slightly different theme that's come up both in the questions um, and in my thoughts and in your comments, which is more about the politics. And I wonder if a good way of doing this is thinking about um, a thought experiment. What would happen if the Director General did go against his emergency committee? You, you've all made comments suggesting that maybe he should, but also at the beginning, Mark, you were saying that the IHR in the first place was kind of brought about to rein in the power of the WHO. So wouldn't, is there a kind of an intrinsic tension there? Wouldn't governments and countries around the world react with fury? What would China say if the w the director general went against his emergency committee or the DRC or all these countries, um, you know, what are the ramifications of, of it using that power that is there? Mark, maybe we start with you. Sure, and I think this comes back to, to one of the, the, the questions which Gianluca raised, which was what can we do to make this system better? Um, and I think one of, one of WHO's major failures is that they, they're constantly trying to depoliticize health. They talk about it all the time. They want to, to, to take the, the politics out of health. And that is frankly impossible. The, you know, as we've said throughout this, throughout this, this book and throughout this talk, the decision to declare a fake is a political decision. But the point which Claire and I are trying to make is that that political decision should be taken by a political actor, not a technical norm, a technical agency where of, of, you know, epidemiologists and virologists, it should be taken by a technical, um, a technical officer, who, uh, by a political officer who has political accountability mechanisms associated with them, which is the DG. As to what would happen if the DG went against the, the advice of the emergency committee, um, I think that's a really good question. I mean, in creating the international health regulations, it's quite clear that states envisaged that that was a possibility. When you look at um, 
at Article 12 of the IHR, which sets out how the Director General declares a fake. Advice of the Emergency Committee is just one of the, the, the factors which, which the DG must take into uh, consideration. I think it's third or fourth on the list. It's certainly not the first thing they, they, they pop down there. So it was quite clear that that was envisaged right from the very start. But what we've had over from 2009 onwards is this entrenchment and this further mission creep of the, the role of the Emergency Committee of taking more and more of those political um, political considerations into account for themselves. And it's not that those consideration, considerations shouldn't be taken into account, it's that they shouldn't be taken into account by the EC. As to what would happen if the, the Director General went against the advice of the Emergency Committee, I think that very much depends on the context. If the Director General went against the advice of, the, of an Emergency Committee who said, don't declare an outbreak in China, and the, the Director General did, I think that's a very different um, example than an emergency committee saying, don't declare an outbreak in Burkina Faso when the Director General did. As Gianluca alluded to earlier, it all comes back to power politics. And that's why it's so important that those political decisions are taken by a political actor who, if they use their political power incorrectly, they're out at the next election or they're before the, the answering questions at the health, uh, the next meeting of the health assembly, which are very uncomfortable ones. So Claire, maybe you have thoughts to add, but uh, just building on what Marcus said, do you think the result then is actually just being way more open about politics in the process and, and, and not allowing the DG to hide behind an apolitical system? Would that, would that give them more power to contradict the emergency committee, perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as we argue in this book, we you know we, we don't think that, that having politics in the process is, is bad, right? We, it's, it's inevitable. And trying to, you know, legal your way out of it and pretend there's no politics is not going to happen. And kind of just having a technical, a technocratic process isn't going to work. So instead, we think you should engage with the politics, right? And engage with it and be open about it. And if that requires certain changes so again this kind of comes back to the kind of what happened next what happens next question that Jan Luca and Sam in both ways you know how do we then factor in a factor in the politics into the process of the fake declaration right does it give a greater role to member states decision making in who's in the room right at the moment the way the EC gets selected is from a roster, and we don't exactly know, and maybe Jan Luca presumably does, but won't tell us, uh, you know, we don't exactly know how people are selected to be in a, a particular emergency committee, right? It's to do with a mix of geographical variation and expertise in the particular pathogen might be, you know, at risk. And member states do also appear, but we're not, you know, do we need to have a greater role for member states in that process to put forward their members to make it a more political process or does there need to be some greater accountability mechanism that again Jan Luca talked about that states can hold that decision making to account I think those that that those are ways that you could add politics in a more rigorous and structured way rather than kind of having the kind of you know behind closed doors and then you know the swiping publicly you know, elsewhere in other diplomatic circles about the same decision. So it can be done in a more, you know, collaborative, cohesive way, I would argue, personally. Yeah, and just to, just to come in on that, um, uh, Claire, it, it's, it's not necessarily about adding more, a greater role for the member state representative in the room. It's just recognising that role. They're there influencing the emergency committee now. We're pretty sure that that's happening, but there's no recognition of it. And part of that comes back to the not to open up Gianluca and I's favourite argument, which is about transparency. Um, we we argue about this a lot normally with wine. We don't have that right now. So we'll keep <laughs> um, but one of the problems we have is a lack of transparency about how emergency committees make their decision and why they reach their decision. Now, that has got a lot better. When you go back to 2009, we didn't even know who was in the room when the decision was made. We didn't know who served on the emergency committee. Now we get a narrative essay from them of, of, of you know, retrospectively fitting the criteria to what decision they came to, and we know who was on, on the panel. But we don't know how they come to their decisions, for example. We don't know whether they vote. We don't know whether, you know, if they do vote, it's a simple majority, or whether you need, you know, 10 to 2 or 11 to 1 or an absolute majority. And we also don't know if those things vary from emergency committee to emergency committee. So each one could be using different processes. And part of that comes down to the transparency of the process itself, which wasn't built into to the 
into the IHR at all. But I think it's quite clear that as the influence of the emergency committee has grown and grown, we need to recognize the, the extraordinary influence they have over the, the fake and as a result over global health responses and build in mechanisms that, that have some transparency associated with them. Okay, so maybe I'm opening a can of worms here, but I think we should hear John Gianluca's response to the uh, transparency argument. Um, and yeah, what 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 do you think is the argument for keeping it less transparent? And also, um, maybe it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts as well on this thought experiment of what would happen if the DG did go against the emergency committee. By the way, my point in a uh, discussion with uh, with Mark uh, is again the role of the emergency committee is to be a technical risk assessor. Uh, it's not the checks and balances, because these people are chosen by the director general to advise the director general. There's no check and balances there. It's all very, very indirectly. It's to strengthen the, if you want, the science behind a, that would support the risk management exercise. Um, and in that sense, I don't see an added value in having the meeting of the emergency committee webcasted. Uh, yes, states can exercise influence on the members, but that influence would be uh, amplified by an order of magnitude if those members know that the government is listening to what they're saying during the meeting of the emergency committee. Uh, obviously, there are consideration of legitimacy and transparency, but they have to be applied to the, to the process as a whole, not to each and every single little segment of the process. So I am in favor of um, keeping it as the way it is, but improving the method of work. I think Mark and Claire have said very correct things in that. It's unclear. Even though, again, the, the reports of the emergency committee have improved tremendously. And if you read them, you get a sense of the reasoning of the emergency committee. And if they voted, they would say in the report that they voted. They don't vote. That's why the, 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 the COVID posed that problem, because they couldn't reach a consensus. And by definition, they don't vote. You don't vote on science. Uh, maybe they should, because they go beyond science and they start engaging in political consideration. But that's, again, not part of the original design. Uh, the selection of members is an interesting, here's the interesting consideration of institutional sociology, because there is quite an inertia. Obviously, the secretariat tries to um, convene people with the right expertise. So you often have epidemiologists, virologists, you have, um, uh, for many meetings, you had somebody from ICAO uh, or somebody, a, um, a former ICAO official, because obviously air travel was was crucial in, in considering recommendations and so on, and also um, geographical representation. But if you look at the, at, the, at the list of members and it's reproduced on the web, you find the same names over and over. So there is a certain inertia in convening people that uh, we know are reliable, but by convening the same people, you create a bit of an echo chamber effect where more or less they tend to say the same things. And you have the same problem in the review committee, by the way. If you look at the COVID review committee, they are all public health people. There's not a lawyer, there's not an economist, there's not a political scientist. You already know even before they meet what they're going to say and not to say. So the interesting um, sociological consideration there that, um, again, in my view, should be part of a discussion on how to improve the system. Obviously, you don't want a dysfunctional emergency committee where the members fight with each other. But a certain diversity and a certain uh, mix of, of, uh, of, of opinions, uh, I think, would help, probably. Simon, I'm going to go to you quickly. Do you have any thoughts to add on this before we use 10 minutes? I do. No, I'll try and be brief, which is just to, I suppose, set this in, in a wider context, which is, I think, really what we're talking about here is what is the appropriate role of scientific advice in policy making, right? And we see that not just within WHO, we see that in every government, right? And it becomes particularly acute and politicized um, in times of emergency. And the DG is, is an interesting position as a kind of hybrid political and technical actor uh, who is clearly there um, elected for political reasons, but also usually comes with some kind of credible claim to having technical expertise in, in health, right? So I think that individual is in an interesting place. What we know about political actors is, is self-preservation is very important to them. Uh, so even Boris Johnson, who I think is still our prime minister, he was, uh, when we started this, uh, started this call, 
you know, even he will say, has said throughout the pandemic, all we're doing is following the science and we're listening by, to the scientific advisors. I think it'd be very brave, just pick, to pick up on your thought experiment, Sarah, I think it'd be a very brave director general that didn't do that because what you open yourself up to immediately are, are the unforeseen future consequences of getting that call wrong, right? So you decide, oh, the emergency committee's wrong. This is not really a, a public health emergency of international concern. And then it runs away and becomes a, a huge global pandemic. You're in a pretty exposed position there. So I can quite easily see why um, director generals would tend to follow the advice of the emergency committee. I think the interesting questions are the ones that Mark raised there about what is that scientific advice? And is it really just scientific advice or is there something more political going on there too? Is this really some kind of hybrid scientific stroke political advice? And then where's the scrutiny of that? I think that's where the interesting questions are. So I'll stop there. I mean, I think you got the biggest head nod of the session so far when you said that about the <laughs> discussing the role of scientific advice. Um, we haven't got much time left. Um, so I think a good way to end the session is to hear from each of you about, and it's coming up a lot in the questions and it's from selfish reasons, it's something I get asked a lot from the newsroom too. So what should we be doing instead? You know, um, someone mentioned earlier this idea of a traffic light system or a regional fake. Um, how, or where are the things that, you know, building on all the conversations we've had, what can we do to, you know, have a maybe a tiered system or um, other adjustments? Claire, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I've written with Mark, Simon and Mark on this, you know, I don't think the uh, a traffic light system is going to work for a fake, right? I think there's inherent problems with it which is that, um, you know, if you have it at a regional level where you're going to have declare a regional fake, for example, or a regional concern, the other parts of the world aren't going to listen. And so that's an issue because, you know, people get on planes and it spreads, as we've seen uh, ever, you know, only so acutely during COVID. Uh, and I think if you have a, a tiered system with traffic lights, that's problematic because basically governments won't do anything until it hits red anyway, because that's what governments do. And so therefore you're creating a binary system anyway right you're just calling it something else and you're just going to take longer to get there so you're going to delay the problem um i don't think that's going to work i think actually what we need to to do first and you know mark touched on it earlier is actually figure out why it's not working now right actually before we jump in with more technocratic solutions before we jump in with you know um uh, you know public health expertise let's take a step back and ask the, the question of well why isn't the system working what does it mean to declare a fake? What do governments do or do not do when a fake is declared? What does WHO do or do not do when a fake is declared? We don't have that consistent evidence base, right? Why is it that governments comply sometimes with the IHR and not in you know, other circumstances? We have a lot of, of um, uh, anecdotal data on this, but we don't have anything consistent. And I think we really have to get to the bottom of that. And then we can design a policy, a piece of international law, a treaty, whatever you want to call it, that actually deals with the problems, right, and not what we perceive the problems to be from, you know, our, our own standpoint. And I think that must be the first step in, in whatever comes next post-COVID and post-IHL. Do you think that first step is happening? I think there's a lot of lessons learned happening. Um, I don't know whether they're actually asking the big question, uh, which, which I see there. Mark, would you like to jump in? Yeah, they, they seem to be the same lessons learned that we've learned from every other IHR review since the first IHR review. Um, so I think we need to, to stop and think about what do we want to achieve here? What do we want a fake to do? Or what do we want our global health governance system to do? Right, because it, it goes back to the point I was I was raising slightly earlier that the, the the design of IHR is very much focused on on prevention um, and 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 um, detection um, and very little around the response. It's about IHR can be viewed as a system that's mainly about making sure that low and middle income countries have systems in place so that we know in high income countries what's coming for us. It's about a flow of information from low income countries into the global north and into WHO and into high income countries. But 
where's the flow of stuff back? Where's the flow of medical countermeasures back? Where's the flow of vaccines back? Where's the flow of, of, of support um, back? So is, if, is, is this all we want, just a system where we find out what's coming for us so that we can close, the, you know, we can, we can close the borders before, you know, to try and delay it a little bit? Or do we want a much more cohesive, supportive um, system, which, which is actually about the flow of information, but also the flow of support back to, to low and middle income countries? Because IHR doesn't do that at all. And lots of the discussion which we're seeing right now around the pandemic treaty is just about further flows of information from low and middle income countries, further um, um, pathogen sharing, further information sharing, but we're hearing very, very little about medical countermeasures going back into low and middle income countries. So I think we have to start by thinking, what, what do we want to fake to achieve? And bigger than that, what do we want our global health security system to achieve? Because at the moment, it's mainly about keeping us safe, not about keeping the world safe. That's a striking um, analysis, I think. Um, I wish we had more time because we've still got loads more questions and I'm sure there's lots more that we could discuss, but I'm also sure that some hungry people are wanting dinner. So I'm just going to go around you all and um, let's have a final thought from each of you. Maybe Simon will start with you um, about this topic and, you know, what are the outstanding questions and, and where do we need to go next? Great. Well, Mark's actually just said better than I could say it. I think what I what my point of view would be in terms of a final word, you know, I think there are clearly problems with the current technical arrangements and the current mechanisms don't work perfectly, but I don't think there is a technical fix to that. I don't think going to three tiers or five tiers or seven tiers of alert solves that. I think as Mark was indicating, this is about a change of mindset. And I think this is about understanding these kinds of challenges as shared global problems. And disease is one big example of that. Climate change is another, right? Where we need to actually not think on nation state basis about these things, but to think much more solidaristically um, and globally about how we might deal with these challenges and how governments can partner with each other to deal with those challenges rather than see themselves in competition as, as they've too often done um, through this pandemic. So I'll leave it there. Absolutely. Gianluca, would you like to share some final parting thoughts next? Uh, difficult to add to, to what uh, Claire, Mark and, and Simon said. Uh, I would say, again, um, a mix, if you're looking at, I think we do need to look at things within the IHR and at the bigger picture, because the IHR is not there in isolation. There are so many things that influence global health security and determine the behavior of state. Uh, there are things to fix in the IHR. They've been discussed quite uh, thoroughly in this panel. Um, they review the post, the post, not the post COVID, but the during COVID review, talk about the bigger picture, question of financing, of some uh, assurance of a better system of allocation of medical countermeasures. Um, and that cannot be fixed in the IHR. Uh, it needs more things. It needs more pieces of the puzzle moving. It needs a better engagement by the United Nations. There has been very much at the sidelines until now. It needs a better engagement by the financial institutions. It needs a uh, like a team approach. Uh, the WHO is part of the picture. Um, and then I think uh, if there is mature leadership, uh, we hopefully will go in this direction. And let me say, I inexcusably did not congratulate Mark and, and Claire for the book, uh, which we definitely read and we'll order for the Institute. And in particular, it's a great example in the disciplinary work, which is not easy at all. So kudos to the two of you. I agree. And with that, let's hear from Mark and Claire. Um, anything, final thoughts you'd like to add or... Uh, parting questions that you think people should go away and think about? Buy our book. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, seems like, good to us. <laughs> that seems like a good place to end. Well, thank you everyone for coming and the panellists um, for a really fascinating Wednesday evening. Um, and yeah, good luck with, with the book. And fingers crossed we'll be having this conversation in a couple of years and lots of these issues will have been solved. Thank yeah, you. Great, great I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks very much, everyone, and thank you all for attending. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.